Hey, how's it going everyone? Before we get started into this next episode, I want to make sure that you've had a chance to check out some of the other shows on the Extreme Performance Outdoor Network that this podcast is now a part of. If you search Extreme with an X at the beginning, Performance Outdoor Network, on whichever podcast platform you listen through, you'll be supporting a network that not only has a lot of great content on it, but also continually gives back to efforts that really try to preserve the rights of houndsmen and hunters across the country. So if you haven't had a chance to listen to any of the other shows yet, I'd highly encourage you to do so. They're a lot of fun. There's a lot of great information on them. And not only will you be supporting the hosts of the other shows on this network, but you'll also be supporting a network that really walks the walk in regards to preserving houndsmen and hunters rights across the country so have fun give them a listen and your support is much appreciated and speaking of support if you want to do more to support this podcast and also hear some more fun content then go to the would you like to support link at falconrychronicles.com and sign up for an extras membership at my buy me a coffee account for just 10 bucks a month, you'll get at least a couple of new episodes a month that'll be exclusive to Extras members. Some of those episodes will also be video, and you'll also get a sticker included with your membership as well. So if you want to do a little bit more and get some extra content to listen to each month, then go ahead and sign up for that 10 bucks a month. You'll be doing a lot to help support the continued sustainability of the podcast. And also, if you have been wanting some Falconry Chronicles merch, there's also a store up now at falconrychronicles.com, and you can pick you up some stuff that previously was unavailable. And here pretty soon, there will be some more different designs and different options that will be available as well so keep checking back there will be more added occasionally and thank you so much for your support and now on to this next episode of the falconry chronicles podcast i was handling original audubon prints and stuff like that like copying them like doing the photography to uh have them reprinted like at at high-end scales and um so I was, I was looking at these things up close and personal, getting to see all the detail on the prints and stuff like that. And as somebody that went to school for printmaking, I was just nerding out on them so much. And, you know, seeing stuff like that is just, I was like, this dude did all of the North American birds, not just the birds of prey, but just like that dedication, seeing that kind of stuff and seeing the way that they were like, how he was setting stuff up. I don't know. It's just... It, it hooked me pretty quickly. Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back for another episode of the Falconry Chronicles podcast. And this is another episode that was recorded earlier this year at the Texas Hawking Association meet. And I was really excited at the time to be able to record this episode with Brett Reese because I've been a big fan of his for a while. He, if you aren't aware or familiar with Brett, he is the person responsible for the Devils of Dirt Hawking Club and... If you haven't seen any of his artwork or designs or anything yet, you need to search Devils of Dirt Hawking on Facebook or Instagram, and you can also go to devilsofdirthawking.com. He just launched a bunch of new designs that will always be available and has also collaborated with Bobby Yaga, and he also is the one who designed all of my new logos and artwork and stuff like that for the new Falconry Chronicles stuff as well, so... I believe he's also going to have a special limited edition pre-order available again soon if it's not out already, so keep an eye out for that. But at any rate, it was fun talking to him about his inspiration getting into all that and starting that up, and then also his falconry experiences as well. So we'll just go ahead and jump right in here and get into this episode with Brett Reese. Here we go. Well, it's great to finally meet you in person. Yeah, you too. Yeah, I mean, I like I said, I've just kind of been acquaintances here, you know, sort of recently, I guess. Damn, this shit is... This, this is pungent. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Awesome. Yeah. No, man, this is... It's it's cool. Like, I've, I've heard of the club, been familiar with the club, 
other people that I'm very good friends with are members of said club. <laughs> and uh, no, it's it's cool to finally uh, get a chance to meet you in person, uh, get to know you a little bit, you know, put the, uh, I always like putting names and faces yeah. together finally and, For and sure. everything else, you know. Yeah, the club thing, it's funny. It was it was always kind of just like a, a tongue-in-cheek joke. Uh -huh. um, but it's uh, just have always been wanting to do something like that, and it just kind of came together. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, how long ago did you form it, quote-unquote? <laughs> uh, shoot. The first release was probably two, tw 2021, something okay. like that, and been releasing like maybe two to three a year yeah. designs. Something like that, or two to three a season, I guess. Do you have any, uh, uh, I don't know, aspirations or plans to kind of um, start doing anything else with the said uh, Devils of Dirt Hawking <laughs> Club? Or yeah, there there are things that I want to do within Falconry with it. Um, uh, new new things to release, more than just T-shirts and stuff like that. But it's just me doing it on my own, um, doing all the research too, and I'm kind of lazy about that kind of stuff, so. <laughs> trying to find sources for certain things like to be more like outdoor like outdoor gear um like field gear and stuff like that so i mean kind of sort of kind of make it a semi-expanded clothing line sort type of. of thing yeah just, just just if people are into it if it can be out in the field and be useful if i can throw a cool design on it that's like that's what i want to do nice yeah yeah so no, we'll see yeah that's awesome man no i mean there's some other friends that I have that have kind of sort of uh, semi done that, mm -hmm. you know, to some degree. I um, <laughs> I'll tell you more about it after we get done recording. But but we did a, a kind of a it's sort of a joke just to kind of harass uh, one of our good hawking buddies. But we uh, we formed a, a hawking club based around Harris Hawk you know hawking called the DBB a few a few handful of years ago or whatever and. Our one, the joke basically behind it was my, our one good buddy in our, in our hawking group, he absolutely just hates Harris Hawks. Like he just, you know, has no desire to ever fly one. Just, you know, it, it, it's a running joke in our little group, mm -hmm. right? So during one of our uh, Kansas meets, well, not really meet, but one of our Kansas uh, Jackrabbit hawking trips, right? We, um, one of our buddies kind of was just like, hey, you know, can you uh, hold the this perch for me real quick? Well, I you know, and so my buddy had his uh, both of his Harris's on a on a T perch, and he um, you know, he just asked Mark. He's like, he's like my buddy Mark. You know, he's like, can you hold this real quick? You know, and and um, so he holds it temporarily, and it's like the paparazzi. Like everybody just kind of fans out, just starts taking <laughs> Take pictures and stuff. And he's just like, he's starting to get all you know mad and stuff. It's hilarious. But anyway, so. As kind of a, a little a little joke, we had some shirts made for our official new Hawking Club, with, and he was like the on the yeah, yep. yeah. I think he he still is probably a little <laughs> a little bitter over it, but it's it's all in good fun. But uh, anyway, that's the closest thing I you know aside from you know whatever I I don't I have in my own little club, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, so what does the DBB stand for? Well, we'll we'll talk about that ah. later. <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, but uh, but th those who know know. Okay. But but we'll we'll I'll, I'll fill you more All right. joke later. Um, but yeah, man. So I mean, it's cool though. I mean, it seems to be that. I mean, people talk about you know this little you know sort of I don't know club or whatever that you made. I mean, and and the designs are pretty cool. Thank and you. So you know, I mean, it's 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 something that's catching on. Yeah. It you know uh, it feels weird. I'll tell you that much. Um, seeing people wearing it and stuff like that. Um, but it's something like I went to school for art. Um, specifically even printmaking. So going into silk screening and stuff like that, it's always been, you know, like I originally wanted to do skateboard stuff and that's what I was really into when I was coming out of high school into college and stuff like that, followed a lot of that stuff. And it just never ended up working out. Like mm -hmm. life got in the way, got into other stuff. And then falconry came around and I got invited to do, uh, Corey Rolke had seen just some of my painting stuff. And I, of course, like all the painting stuff I do is all birds of prey too. And uh, he saw that and was like, hey, would you be willing to do the THA meet, the 2020 shirt? I think it was 2020. Pretty sure it was. Uh, and I was like, sure. So I did it. And he had mentioned that it was it just did really well. He was like, you got something going on. So I was like, okay. Well, that kind of sparked the, you know, the fire or whatever. And was like, okay, that people, there is a market for it, I guess. Sure. So. Yeah. 
Well, and it's it's cool getting like that positive reinforcement. You know, I mean, I think that it, sometimes the littlest spark is really all you need to kind of, uh, for a lot of people anyway, to kind of take whatever just is kind of sort of a, I don't know, a side endeavor and make a real creative leap, you know, as far as just kind of naked, taking the, as far as taking the next step with it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it, it's cool, like whenever people kind of dig what you're doing in an artistic way, you know, it, it, it's the same for like art, music, whatever, yeah. you know, podcasting, whatever, it just kind of, yeah. So, I mean, it's cool that that, that was a, a nice little spark for you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, like I said, I'm thankful that people are into it and it just, it does still feel weird to see people like rocking it, but it, you know, it makes me feel happy too. And it makes me want to keep on doing it. So as long as people are willing to buy it, I'll, I'll be trying to make something. <laughs> so. Well, I mean, do you, do you make enough off of it to just kind of continue to cover your costs and justifying to, to do it and stuff or? Yeah, for sure. Um, really, to be honest, the the biggest reason why I wanted to start doing doing it was to afford to do falconry. Really, so it 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 subsidized my falconry, and that's how I pay to go. Like that's how I bought my GPS system. That's how I updated my Muse like setup. You know, I didn't have really the money to do it otherwise. Damn. So I was like, all right, well, it's kind of two birds in a you know in the scenario. So is it still kind of like an unofficial business or do you, isn't it a legit like no, LLC had, or anything? I had to go legit. <laughs> <laughs> I tried, uh, you know, they had updated during COVID, they had updated the, the laws for small businesses. And I was like, dude, I'm making enough money with it that I need to make sure I cover my bases. Well, that's fantastic yeah. though, man. Cause I mean, normally, you know, the, the unofficial rule of thumb for most businesses, what I've always been told is if you're making less than 10 grand a year, who cares? Like the IRS isn't oh, going to really, yeah. you know, apparently but, they care now yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or at least enough that my wife was like, you better, you better make sure this shit is not going to come back on you. I was like, okay, I will. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, man. Well, I mean, that's awesome though. I mean, yeah. If you're, if you're in that position, then you're doing something right. Yeah. No, it's in, like I said, it's, it's great. I really, Really enjoy doing it um, with the money that I made from that I was able to upgrade my art setup so now I'm doing I'm able to use like a tablet system instead of hand drawing everything so it speeds up the process um, so the latest one that came out the the Reaper with the Goshawk was all done on a tablet and it's probably the best design I did and it's because I was able to switch over and use that kind of stuff nice nice so I mean do you it sounds like then that you've kind of made the transition like a lot of artists have with a lot of the digital, you know, production aspect of things. I mean, there's a lot of guys that I know that have, um, and women too, that, uh, really nice. I mean, prominent, you know, semi-prominent artists anyway, that have really been transitioning to traditional oil painting and drawing and stuff to doing those digital, you know, there's just, just drawing everything on, on the tablet and everything. Yeah. And, and dude, I can barely draw stick figures, <laughs> you know? So like any, any time I'm a huge original art guy and, um, anytime I can get my hands, it's like, it's another thing. that's like cracked to me, just like falconry hoods and stuff. So I'm, it's, it's always nice seeing, you know, people being able to, to successfully continue to do that, make the transition. And, yeah. and I mean, was it difficult for you to, to kind of make the transition to that? From I'm, the- I mean, I'm used to using, uh, the Photoshop suite. And mm-hmm. so I'm using procreate now for this setup and, um, just learning the actual setup was hard, but like, you know, once you're running on it, it's fine. Um, I still am a huge fan of, I, I use it as a tool. So I'm still a hardcore painter, like the paintings that I do, I might use uh, the tablet to do some rough sketches before I transfer it over. But I mean, I love if I had more time, if I could make enough money off of it, I would do painting for a living. I would love to do that. But it's just, there's not enough time in, in, you know, in a day to do everything. But I love doing watercolor. Um, That's like my sweet spot. Um, and it lends over to like a, a lot of the stuff that I do is kind of like uh, influenced by traditional tattoo work and watercolor is, is the preferred medium for that. And, like, you know, it just all kind of like works together. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's um, like I said, all that stuff is Greek to me, dude. You know, if you gave me a pencil, like I said, stick figure, you know, whatever. <laughs> and uh, that's about the best I can do. Um, you know, most of whatever creative 
stuff I had came in the form of music and audio oh, yeah. and whatever. Oh, yeah. And I, you know, it's 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 different. You know, yeah. but but you've delved into that a little bit too, right? You're you bass player also. Yeah, somebody, right? yeah. We were talking about that last night. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was in a past life, not anymore. Yeah. But uh, definitely, music had a huge influence on me when I was I was growing up. I mean, it still does. But like, um, just being in and again goes into going to school for printmaking. I was wanting to do band shirts, like that kind of stuff, like always the art side of that. The bands that I was in, we were doing all the graphics for it and like, you know, putting shirts out and stuff like that. So it's nothing new to me, but it's um, finally at a scale that I can afford to make quality stuff, which is, it's it's important to me. And we have, I have some buddies that I went to school with that do the printing for me. So I'm able to like be in there and talk to them directly and, you know, get everything squared away um and be particular about things i guess <laughs> yeah i mean it's uh it's it's definitely something that any kind of artistic endeavor you it's you really have to be careful about mitigating you know what how much resources and time effort and energy go into it because yeah. it can be a life and a time suck if you let it mm -hmm. and you know if if you it, it, if you start spending too much time and money on it you just find yourself continuing to do it because you keep self almost justifying it. And you hope that there's eventually going to be, I don't know, a uh, kind of uh, a turning point, I guess, you know, and, and some kind of a reward for your investment. But mm -hmm. mo most of the time there's not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> what, you know, like uh, the stuff that I do, like it's, falconry i i can't say that it's necessarily a hobby anymore but it's taken over pretty much everything that i'm interested in besides my family um but yeah if you can just get everything working together if you kind of make a misstep at least you're still going in the right direction mm -hmm. yeah so. and there was a, a large period of time in my life that i was really putting a lot of all of my spare everything into you know, bands and, and resources, but, you know, just trying to make music work. And, and I'm not going to say that it's never done anything for me because I've developed a huge amount of really great relationships and, and have a, just a, a metric ton of, of amazing memories, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but can I say that financially or anything else it was worth it? Hell no. Yeah. No, 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 yeah, yeah. no. And, uh, but you know, and, and, it really is, you know, the more I continue to do these podcasts and the more people that I meet, particularly Falconers, it, it still is amazing to me just how many Falconers are really amazing artists and, you know, or musicians or whatever. It's like that creative bone. And, and I think that that there's probably a reason for that and the fact that, you know, Falconry is also an, an art, art form, in, yeah. in and yeah, of itself absolutely. too. But I mean, over the years, I mean, so remind me again, how many years you've been Falconry now? Man, so I'm young. I'm not young, young in falconry. Uh, yeah. This is my fourth year as a, uh, as a general. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm on my second bird. It's another red tail. Um, and, but again, like I found for, for where I am, for what we can hunt, um, it's, she's a hammer on squirrels and that's what I was looking for. So, um, again, going into the dirt hawking stuff, it was just like rabbits and squirrels is kind of what I got my teeth cut on or whatever in falconry and i just love it so this today was actually the first day ever that i went out with long wingers in seven years or six years whatever it is it's different isn't it yeah it was well it is and it isn't but it was it was super fun to see people dealing with the same shit just <laughs> in a, with a different bird like having problems with it and working through the problems and sure. you know whatever well and, and anybody that says that they never do it is lying period mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> i mean it, it is what it is it, it doesn't matter what you're flying what you're doing if, if falconry is is involved everybody's gonna have issues come up i mean like i said i mean there there's I, i'm I, everybody has an ego to some degree i think you know in, in this but you know having and i'm still you know, relatively young in, in my career too i mean i've my first uh, my first apprentice season was, you know, fall of 2015 was the first time, you know, I got my first bird. So, yeah, so you're, you're a little, a couple years before me, but not too far. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, relatively same amount of time, yeah. but you know, a lot of lessons 
a lot of them hard learned in that mm -hmm. period of time and stuff. But, but what, yeah, I mean, and I've seen enough and even in, it's not even, I mean, different countries all around the world. And, you know, everybody has the same issues. Oh yeah, for period, sure. Period. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but no, it's cool though that, I mean, it sounds like as far as the dirt hawking and stuff goes though, you're another one of these, and you're another falconer that, that has been fortunate to be in a position where what you're doing from the beginning is the most conducive thing that you should be doing anyway. Yeah. And you enjoy it. And yeah, for sure. I mean, it just, it, it clicked like pretty quickly. Um, and I know like, you know, I'm, I'm living in the North Texas area. There's plenty of ponds that you can, you know, and there's plenty of dudes that are running peregrines hitting ducks all the time. But it just, for me, it just never scratched that itch. It didn't seem to. And I haven't really, like I said, I haven't seen it. I still didn't see it today. They were, they were running for pheasant today instead of uh, ducks when I went out. Mm -hmm. um, I missed the duck train early in the morning. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, I, you know, uh, it hasn't made me bored yet. So uh, I'm, I'm still out there. Broke a leg a couple of years ago doing it. Had to have something surgically removed my, from my leg last year. My bird's down with a broken wing right now. Like, you know, it's tough. Like yeah. where we're out going, it's, it's, it's hard living, but it's fun. Yeah, man. It's not for the faint of heart by yeah. any stretch. And, and for anybody that wants to portray it as being easy or, you know, whatever. I mean, I think most people that are very real falconers would never do that. You know, mm -hmm. it's not easy. It's, uh, it's very much a, a taxing endeavor in a lot of ways and mm -hmm. a lot of aspects of life, yeah. as you know. And, uh, but what I can tell you is, I mean, the long wing bug, I know for me, it kind of bit me early. I, I really wanted to try and find a way and I'm still trying to think of ways that I can make it work for me in my yeah. area because I love Falcons. I think they're cool. I mean, I, and I love the flight style and, um, having gotten a chance now to see, you know, falconry in other countries and especially different forms of, of long wing, like with the snipe hawking and other things like I think it can be done. But, you know, I mean, if it, it, I, I'm envious in a lot of ways of guys like yourself and, and other people that I know that discovered just how fun like squirrel hawking and stuff like that can be from an entry level yeah, standpoint. Because, one. yeah, because mm -hmm. it's, I mean, red tails and squirrels are like, you know. Peas and carrots. Yeah, so they're, speak, and they're know. easy to find. So. Yeah. <laughs> and I wish I would have uh, been able to really discover that or appreciate that sooner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but nobody, in my sponsor at the time and nobody else in my group for the most part, with the exception of one other buddy that it, that I hawk with, really likes squirrel hawking. Mm -hmm. So, I, I, you know, it took me a while. Yeah. You know, I mean, just in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have gotten into it way sooner. Mm hmm yeah, I started out, you know, as an apprentice, like just trying to push for rabbits, like that, that whole thing with a red tail. And, you know, it was, I guess, kind of fighting the landscape a little bit because there's squirrels everywhere where I live, like fox squirrels, but rabbits and rabbits are there too, but they're not as, you just can't get them pushed as easily, especially mm -hmm. like I'm not running a dog. As, and when I was uh, an apprentice, I mean, even now still, you know, I get together with my buddy, Ryan, Corlew and we'll go out um on the weekends together and hunt all of our birds but like during the week it's just me it's just me and the bird out there pushing stuff and so trying to cover field to get a rabbit to jump with one person is it sounds pretty miserable. tough yeah well yeah. hey you're putting in you know you're putting in miles on your feet and just oh, yeah. going and going and going but like finding squirrels you know in the dfw area they're everywhere. They're everywhere because where we're hunting is in an ur like semi-urban environment. So you're hitting woodlots on the side of a neighborhood that just went up and all those squirrels that are hanging out in those trees are, are out in that woodlot and stuff like that. And you can find them a lot easier. Sure. So it just happened that way. Yeah. Well, and, and like I said, I mean, I, I, um, I like having the option of doing both, especially now, like, you know, like Ryan, I'm running dachshunds and mm -hmm. stuff and, and um, being able to have dogs that will do both is is nice and and but I mean like as far as dirt hawking in and of itself goes, I will always from now on prefer squirrel hawking over over rabbit hawking for sure. And it's just so much more dynamic. It is, yeah. and and gosh, man, it's so much more uh, interactive. Mm -hmm. I mean, I enjoy rabbit hawking now with 
you know, with hawks a little bit more than I used to now, but it's, it's all because of my dogs. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not because of, of the interaction between just the hawk and the, and, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, that first season with my first red tail on rabbits, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I didn't think I would have as much fun as I did. But that being said, it doesn't even come anywhere near close to the fun that I've had squirrel hawking. Yeah. But I mean, do you, do you think you'll ever, you know, try and incorporate dogs at some point or? Oh yeah. I, I mean, again, going out with my buddy Ryan, who has, who's running two dachshunds. You've with seen the cast. value of oh, it. Oh yeah. 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 Pretty, pretty immediately. And I mean, he's running, his dachshunds are, are trained squirrels and they'll track them on the ground and push them to the next tree. And you know, those dogs. Little wiener dogs running after a squirrel is pretty hilarious, but I mean, they're putting in work <laughs> doing it. And yeah, um, yeah I, we have my home situation. I can't have a hunting dog right now, but eventually it's, 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 ha it's going to happen. Yeah. So I'm kind of, I'm taking the time to do the research, see exactly what I want, what's going to work best in my terrain. Um, you know, in the situations that I am again, like kind of semi-urban hawking, like roads are a big factor, recalls a must. Like can't have somebody just running out there, you know, so just taking the time to do that. So when, when it's time to pull the trigger, I got like the right thing. You're smart. You're smart. Oh, well, I don't know about that, but <laughs> trying to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You're smart in this application. <laughs> Let me narrow that down for you. Yeah, no, I am. Um, and a, as we were talking about some last night too, I mean, you know, I've got Vigilas and I've got Dachshunds and, and, um, you know, I, uh, don't I love my Vigilas and I've I, this is something I've talked about many times before too. But I, I um for for semi urban settings, bigger dogs don't, in my humble opinion, just don't work as well. Yeah. If you've got a semi urban setting, you need to and have like a or an urban type you know environment to hunt in. You're you're better off with a little bit smaller dogs. Yeah, because they they work stuff a little bit more, a little bit slower. Yeah, methodically, methodically, mm -hmm. and. You know, I mean, for, for squirrels, it's hard to beat, you know, your deckers and, right. and stuff like that, if that's really what you're exclusively wanting to do. But yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, my dogs too will, I mean, if they see a squirrel or scent one, I mean, they'll scent one I mean, mm -hmm. they'll, and they'll go up and they'll bark, yep. you know, if they see one, they'll bark up the tree. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got videos of, of both of my dogs, you know, doing like what we were talking about, you know, tossing a squirrel over in a string or whatever. And, and, um, you know, them just barking their, barking their heads off, you know, at that squirrel, you know, mm -hmm. when you pull it up and stuff, you know, so they'll do it. They're not known for it, but they'll do it. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, then you, you know, again, and seeing Ryan's dogs do it, like you have the benefit of a dog that'll track a squirrel, but can also get in holes for rabbits. Exactly. And out here, you know, it's all that, um, you know, all that downed farm equipment, that's all those like um, mm -hmm. irrigation pipes and stuff like that. I mean, if you haven't seen it, throwing a dachshund in one of those things and bunnies popping out the other end, it's it's fun. Sure. It's, it's e quote unquote easy hawking, but it's fun. It's yeah. a lot of fun. Well, and yeah, theoretically, you know, uh, getting bunnies out from underneath the sheds or out of pipes and stuff, theoretically is easy. Mm -hmm. But... I have seen plenty of birds botch it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, nothing's guaranteed. No. But, you no. know, um, talking about a beautiful flight. But again, I guess if you're dirt hawking, you're not necessarily looking for that poetic flight into the distance. It's like down, getting dirty, and hey, if you're looking for stuff. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And if you're looking for poetic flights into the distance, you're talking about upland, you know, stuff mm -hmm. with either falcons or you know, your long flights with either pheasant or quail with like goshawks yeah. or something like yeah. that or whatever. What we do is not uh, that elegant. Right. You know? Yeah. But it's just as hard and just as fun in a lot of different oh, ways. Oh, for I sure. Think. Yeah. And that's, uh, speaking of Vizlas, I got to watch one run today for the first time in person. And yeah, yeah, you can never have one of those out in an urban environment. That thing just kept running, kept running. And it's just like, <laughs> yeah, and, it was fun to watch. And don't get me wrong. I mean, whenever I first got, whenever I first got Shay, my female Vigla, um, she, I mean, I caught rabbits with her, with my one Harris that I was flying at the time. But the problem is, is, is those bigger dogs with those smaller urban spots, they just burn them out so fast. Mm -hmm. And because they run, like they can't help it, you know, and they, they burn them out so fast. They cover such a wide range of area 
so fast, your bird's not going to be in the right position half the time when right. they do kick something up. Yeah. She would scent rabbits. I mean, I got rabbits with her. You know, I mean, it, it worked, but it's not like I, ideal. Yeah. And whenever I got her, and this is the important thing and why you're smart in this application, when I got her and decided to, I, I was more, I didn't know what I didn't know at the time as an apprentice. I mean, that was my first apprentice season when I got her. Mm -hmm. So I was sucked in by the kind of the romanticism behind, you know, and this applies to hawks and dogs, you know, yeah. too. I mean, you know, they, they were a breed that was bred for falconry originally known for their, you know, good family traits being an indoor and, you know, dog and everything too. I was just like, this really just fits, you know, yeah. and in theory it fits, you know, but it, in time you, you come to find that it really doesn't fit in certain applications. And had I known, I would have probably just started off with dachshunds. Yeah. I looked into them, but you know, once again, you're, you're, I'm complimenting you for, for doing your due diligence. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. I guess it's, yeah. it's, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm kind of running down like split between a Decker or like a dachshund basically. Yeah. And I've seen the benefit of both. I'm, I've seen the benefit of dachshunds in person mm -hmm. and watching like Fincher's videos and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Seeing those guys run. Old just, gozer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That dog is, it's a monster. And so, yeah. I mean, yeah, again, I think for the situations that I'm in, it's one or the other. And, I just haven't really figured it out yet. Yeah, you will. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think overall, um, yeah, if I was only for sure doing, and don't get me wrong, you know, the, the Deckers, especially dogs like Gozer, like my, my buddy Jared has, has a Decker also that loves rabbits. I mean, they'll, they'll send out rabbits and stuff too. They, mm -hmm. They'll do it. Problem is, is they can't fit into those super tight exactly. spaces. Yeah, exactly. exactly. So you don't have quite the, the level of flexibility and diversity. Right. And so. that's kind of what, you know, the fields that I hunt on, thankfully, I guess, <clears throat> it's pretty blended, like squirrels and and certain fields, it's, you know, 50-50 rabbit slips too. And But where these rabbits are held up, again, you know, this is on the corner of a neighborhood or whatever. Mm -hmm. And where we live, it's all honey locust and mesquite and stuff like that. And it's just fortresses of stuff that you cannot get in. Yeah. And the dachshunds just up under there and i don't even think a decker could fit into a lot of that stuff and just you know they're just up under it pushing stuff out you know three three bunnies shooting all, all directions when it gets into one of those piles and you know it's uh so yeah it's it's it i could see the dynamics of that maybe working out better yeah yeah and for most situations it it probably will Especially mm -hmm. if you're in a semi-urban setting where there is some degree of cover and, and tight spaces. Yeah. Know? But anyway, well, I mean, well, I want to transition and, you know, do like we usually do and just talk about how, you know, you got into falconry in the first place. How did you discover it? I mean, what what's the story behind all that for you? Um, Golly, it's, you know, I've tried to think about this to like do the elevator pitch, like narrow it down. And it's, it's hard. <laughs> um, I, uh oddly listened to you know been into it i'm i'm from around the houston area and they have a renaissance festival thing so when i was a kid i got to see them do their whole you know falconry presentation thought it was super cool and then just like went on as a kid and um uh, in college i was listening to npr while i was working at a job and uh i i wish i knew i wish i could find the audio file of it but they had, you know, it was a DFW area NPR and they had interviewed people from THA and they had like this whole thing on like falconry in Dallas. And I was like, I didn't know that that's even a thing, especially around here. And, uh, put it in the back of my mind, like started to look at it then. But again, I was in college at the time, was in an apartment, looked up the rules and regulations. Then I was like, well, I can't, this isn't going to work. So I just kind of let it go again. And finally, when we bought a home and I had the space, I was like, you know what? I think it, I think it's time. <laughs> and I talked to my wife. I was like, Hey, I got something to tell you. And she was like, uh Oh, <laughs> and uh, I was like, I think I kind of want to do falconry. And that and was, she's she like, was like, she's like, Oh, <laughs> she's like, that's definitely not what I thought you were about to say. <laughs> um, 
So I just started looking back into it, became a member of TH Day, tried to like get out there, meet people, stuff like that. But it was already like within the artwork that I was doing, I just kept going back to Birds of Prey. And I couldn't, you know, it all, like I said, when, when everything's moving in the same direction, at least as an artist, you got to kind of listen eventually. And um, I was just so infatuated or interested in Birds of Prey and like, how can I get closer to them? What can I do to be out there and see these things in person, not just on a power pole where I'm when I'm driving by and stuff like that. And so, you know, those first couple of meets that I went to and people were just sitting out with the red tails, like talking, I was like, this is insane. Um, so from there, just like try to get into it. Um, but it was definitely kind of inspired by the art that I was doing and just wanting to be closer to the birds to understand them better. And see, you know, see how they moved, see what they did, how they reacted. And then, you know, there's all sorts of other stuff that goes into that. But it was, you know, I was pretty much hooked instantly. As soon as I saw one in person, I was like, okay, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Nice. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I mean, and, and everybody has this different pathway to, to finding out that number one, it even exists, let alone that they can do it. And, you know, and it, it's, it's great once again like hearing about all these other you know everybody seems to to have this unique path and mm -hmm. sure i mean there's so many people that read like you know my side of the mountain and whatever and get into it and discover it in different ways and you know i just uh like i said i it, it from an artistic point of view though i mean having talked to other like prominent like wildlife artists, particularly bird of prey artists and stuff mm -hmm. like, you know, Andy Ellis and, and a lot of those guys and stuff. It's cool, you know, talking to somebody else that kind of got inspired by or, or went down the avenue of through, through art. Yeah. You know? Well, do you, I mean, I, again, printmaking background, looking at Audubon prints all the time. Like I actually, in one of the, the ironically, the job that I was at listening to the NPR thing, um, it was a, art reproduction company out of Dallas and I was handling original Audubon prints and stuff like that, like copying them, like doing the photography to uh, have them reprinted like at, at high end scales. And um, so I was, I was looking at these things up close and personal, getting to see all the detail on the prints and stuff like that. And as somebody that went to school for printmaking, I was just nerding out on them so much <laughs> and, you know, seeing stuff like that is just, I was like, this dude did all of the North American birds, not just the birds of prey, but just like that dedication, seeing that kind of stuff and seeing the way that they were like, how he was setting stuff up. I don't know. It's just, it, it hooked me pretty quickly. Yeah. And there's, I mean, I, I, I can't say it enough as an original art lover. I always am just amazed at how so many people are able to get like the minute details mm -hmm. and stuff. And there's, there's a few artists that I've, you know, bought art from and stuff throughout my time that just, just absolutely nailed like the finer details. Oh of, yeah. It makes me mad. Yeah. It makes me really mad. <laughs> These guys are phenomenal and I'm just trying to like eke out and like figure stuff out. But I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful work. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like I said, man, it's, it's, it's cool, you know, like in all those different capacities, you know, finding your way and, and kind of finding your way into falconry through that is, is pretty, pretty interesting. Yeah. You know, and, and like I said, I, I don't know, I wish that I was able to, to have a little bit more of a, of a true, like, I don't know, as far as art in and of itself, drawing, painting and stuff, it'd be cool to have that bone in my body as far as that goes, but I do not have that at all so I, i'm like i said i, I appreciate it and part of the reason why i'm such a nerd about it is just because i think it's it's one of those things i just appreciate you know so yeah. much is because i don't have it you know? yeah but well it's a lot of you know it's a lot of time it's a lot of staring at stuff and just like trying to break it apart yeah like i can't say that i'm some great artist but like it's just with any even with falconry it's putting in the hours sitting there just doing it and that's what sucks now is like when the falconry season starts, I'm done painting. Mm -hmm. And um, I hate it because the more that I've done this stuff, devil's dirt hawking, like just doing uh, commission, like falconry paintings. And I love doing them, but like, I got like 
at least a two year wait list right now. Mm-hmm. If I can't just turn you away, just being like, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, tr- I'm trying, I hate doing that because I'm so thankful that anybody is interested in what I'm doing, but I just don't have the time and I hate it, but I guess it's a good thing. I don't know to have, to have people wanting yourself that much to where I'm like, Hey man, I want to do this for you, but you got to wait about three years. Yeah. So if you're willing to, <laughs> yeah. then we can work something out. It's a good problem to have. I mean, people liking your stuff is a good problem to have. It's just all the other finer details and those transactions and that that interest that mm-hmm. is kind of the downer sometimes. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally get it. I mean, I wish that I was able to play bass as much as I used to. I mean, in high school, you know, I would lock myself in my room anywhere between two to five hours every oh, yeah. night. You know, oh, yeah. and, and, um, you know, I mean, I, I am nowhere in my humble opinion of myself, I'm nowhere near as good as I used to be. And, and especially getting to be friends with and getting to know so many of these truly professional musicians, professional in the fact they can call themselves professional mm-hmm. musicians because they make their living doing that. Right. I can't say that. Yeah. And I'm, and I don't think I'll ever be able to at this mm-hmm. point. I'm like you, I, uh, I don't think that it's ever going to become feasible for me to be able to say that or, or make, uh, I don't know, any kind of income or living off of it. But hey, man, you know, I mean, you're able to still do something on the side that you enjoy doing and people dig it. And yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's fun. And I, I try, like, I really do try and put time and like foresight into it. But again, I'm so... I don't know if you would consider it because of like that art side of it, but like, I'm so disorganized. I don't want to do any of the uh, back end stuff for any of it. I just want to do the art, but like, because it's just me, like I had to, I do all the fulfillment. It's sitting in my office, like in our two, two bedroom home. One of the bedrooms that's my office is also just now full of shit, like full of full of shirts <laughs> and full of that kind of stuff. And my wife is so understanding about it. But like that's the reason why I have to do the pre-orders. And then once they're gone, they're gone. Like if you didn't order it, then that's it. It's because I have no place to put that stuff. Yeah. And then I'm doing all the fulfillment too. I'm shipping everything out by hand. And um, it's fine, but like it's just that much extra stuff that I'm like, I, it's, it's tough. It's not something that I enjoy doing, but yeah. it's, you know, something that's got to be done. Yeah. And I mean, there's plenty of third party services that'll do all that stuff for you, but it's that much less that you're getting in exactly. return for your, yeah. for your time and money investment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always a give and take thing, man. You know, I, I get it and totally get it. But uh, anyway, I'm sure we could just shoot the shit about this stuff for like ever, but, um, you know, I, before we get too much further, I mean, I do want to, um, you know, get a couple of, of more of your like memorable, like hunting stories and stuff, and just talk a little bit more about, you know, some of your more impactful experiences, you know, in your, you know, in your short time in the sport too, before we go much further. Yeah. Well, I guess, um, I have a couple, uh, I'll say being in Lubbock again, every, People that have been here know the spot that I'm going to, I'm not even going to say it, but there's a spot here um, that my bird got her first triple on. It was, it was all rabbits. And that was incredibly memorable to me. It was, it was, and it was just me and her nobody else was there. <clears throat> and we were able to push, I mean, it happened in like 30 minutes. She had three rabbits in the bag and that was just, you know. I was like, I don't even have to, I was heading out to meet up Ryan in New Mexico. I was like, I could just turn around right now. I already did it. <laughs> like we're, you know, I don't, the rest of the, and it actually turned out to be the rest of the time out in New Mexico, we didn't see shit. <laughs> or at least I, when my bird was up, we didn't. Um, so that was great. And I think, I know that you've had Ryan on this. I know that he, he told me that he told the story of the raccoon uh, in his Harris Hawk. And I was there, that was the first time I ever met him. <laughs> didn't know this guy at all met him off of npr i don't know did i tell that part of the story i don't think so um i put out as a um uh before i even had a bird you know of course land acquisition like having to get that shit taken care of so there in in 
in Dallas, there used to be a show that it was kind of like a call in, like a local call in, like you had a question about like, Hey, what do I put in my garden to like get rid of these bugs or whatever? So I was like, all right, well, I need land and I don't know anybody around here. So I put it out. I was like, Hey, I'm a falconer. Um, if there's anybody out there listening that has land that they don't mind having a hawk on to hunt, if they want to see it, whatever, like get in touch with me. And, uh, Ryan messaged me. I didn't know this guy at all yet. And he was like, Hey, were you just on NPR asking about, uh, land acquisition and stuff like that? I was like, yeah, that was me. He was like, all right, come out with me. So we went out and it was actually the only other person that contacted me from that was a guy that was like, Hey, I have a field out here. Come check it out. So we did. And the field, it was just an open kind of barren field. There wasn't anything in it. And that's not his fault. It was just, that's how it was. <clears throat> but along the sides, it was perfect squirrel hawking area. And so Ryan had his first uh, Harris hawk out there. And she was like a pretty big female that was aggressive towards everything, like game wise. And we're out there running around, starting to wrap it up because there's nothing out there. And she lands next to this squirrel nest and she inches over, kind of looking at it, bobbing her head, and she just throws a foot in. Mm hmm. And this fucking raccoon falls out <laughs> of like, you know, 50 feet up in the air. That thing just got pushed out of a squirrel nest and falls to the ground. Of course, the bird is right on top of it. Mm -hmm. They fall into a creek, about a 10 foot drop. And it's just pure chaos. <laughs> and uh, Ryan's fallen down into the creek, has a uh, shiv and tries to dispatch the raccoon. Doesn't work. So this... Harris Hawk is latched onto this raccoon. Ryan's trying to kill it. It's running up a bank with a ship sticking out of the back of its neck. <laughs> this bird chasing it into a hole, like into the other side of the bank. And it was just like pure chaos. And that was the first time I had been hunting. <laughs> and that landowner was just like, that was pretty cool, man. Did you get it? And we're like, no, <laughs> that was the worst thing that could happen. And uh, anyway, that left a pretty big, I mean, that's the biggest, you know, impression that I had, like, just out of, the, out of the gate. I was like, wow. That's funny. Yeah. I mean, I uh, I think the first, I know the first couple times I got out, it was, and, you know, I've mentioned many times here on the podcast that I've been inundated and just, I mean, there's so many people still that, like, don't have very much like goshawk exposure and stuff like that. Really haven't seen any fly literally from the moment that I have like witnessed falconry, shadowed falconry, been into falconry at all. I've been exposed to goshawks, right? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I still, I still remember too. I mean, I think I've mentioned this before also, but you know, I mean, your your first time out what were your ex expectations of like the people that you were around or, or meeting or did you have any uh i don't know if i had any but i definitely it was a very eclectic bunch <laughs> that i wasn't necessarily ready for yeah yeah and and that was the other thing too like when i had my initial exposure like i kind of purposefully aired my nerdery out for everybody to see <laughs> i remember like i i've mentioned this before as and the reason i'm asking you this is because i didn't know if you kind of took this approach also but like the first time i ever went out hawking pretty much i mean i came out i had a donatello freaking uh you know beanie on <laughs> and stuff i mean my ninja turtles freaking you know beanie <laughs> and um you know i mean mid-season i was i i I had sold motorcycle I used to have. So I was wearing freaking like motorcycle chaps, chaps out just, <laughs> just because that was the, you know, I didn't want to buy, you know, briar chaps uh -huh. yet. I was like, well, I might as well shred these first, you yeah. know, and whatever. And, and so, you know, I was also testing the waters on the other side too. I was like, okay, so yeah, they can make fun of me. I don't care, but I want to see how they make fun of me. You know what mm. I mean? And you know, the interaction, I want to see if it was going to be a good fit for both sides, you know, like if they were going to be true and harsh, you know, asses about it or whatever, then okay. But if, if I know that it's in the spirit that it's, you know, whatever, it's acceptable, whatever, I'm fine. But did you go into, you know, your first hawking outing with any kind of expectations of how, you know, if they were going to like treat you or hope to, to treat you or anything oh, like I that? Mean, or? I'm very 
And it's, again, it sucks to see everybody out there. Like people actually do come up to me and they're like, Hey man, I really like your stuff. I'm very introverted. I hate talking to people normally. <laughs> and, um, I just was sheepish. I was quiet and like, I was just like, okay, I hope I'm doing everything right. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to make noise. I don't want to be in the way of anybody. Um, but yeah, like, um, I mean, it was great. The The group of people that I met initially, like I'm still friends with a lot of them. They're super great dudes and ladies, like most of them are downstairs right now. Um, yeah, it was, it, I, I wouldn't say it was a culture shock, but it was definitely like, oh, these dudes are like hardcore nerds about this stuff in the best way. I want to be that too. Like, it, you know, it kind of just, the group of people is just like, we're all into this super hardcore. And if you're not, then you probably shouldn't be doing it maybe, you know? So I guess in a way it's like more my, I feel more myself now than like in anywhere else, hanging out with any other people. Like everybody has such a shared experience and it's so funny. My wife will like roll her eyes. <laughs> so we'll just sit, be sitting there like a couple Falconers talking together. And she's like, Oh, She's on, you know, they're on that stuff again. Just like <laughs> recounting stories like, oh, this bird did that and he cut that way and blah, 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 blah. And she's like, I don't care. I yeah. don't care at all. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I hope you all die right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it's the same with my wife too, man. She could not care less and just whatever. But, <laughs> but I mean, I guess the, the reason why I'm, I'm kind of going down this train of conversation or this, this train of thought is you know, this is another thing that, that I want people to, to hear a lot. And, and like for anybody that's wanting to get into this or is currently in it and is just kind of possibly disheartened or, or whatever, make sure that you're going out with people that are, that fit you in your yeah, personality. Oh, for sure. And not every group of people is going to be your group. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If you're, if you're happen to be new to it at all, try and find as many people as you can go out with as possible. Because like you said, like you'll, you'll fit into the crowd that works for you. Exactly. And if you have a dark sense of humor, <laughs> find other guys that have a dark sense yeah. of humor. Um, if you are a little bit more sensitive and need um, positive reinforcement, I don't know where you're going to find that, <laughs> but, but at the same, but at the same time, like try and find, if that's the case, try and find what fits your personality. Mm -hmm. And if you're, if you're listening to this and you're trying to look for a sponsor or whatever, try and find people that are going to be a good fit for you. Because if you do not, you are in for a little bit of an extra hardship. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, that's, a, yeah, for sure. Like I, I was lucky with my sponsor, but like you gotta be, you know, there's that fine line of being coddled and being like, Hey man, you gotta get it together. Like this is, you know, you're not doing what you should be doing right now. And like taking that in a way that's just not like, Oh, oh like it's <laughs> terrible. Like it, you know, but sometimes like feeling bad about like, man, I really messed this up. Like this needs to be fixed. Like this, the bird's doing this and I don't know what to do. Figure it out. Like if, if sometimes that's all it takes, like some tough love or whatever. Sure. Well, and, and don't you think also that like, yeah, you need, you need to number one, know how to accept constructive criticism. Oh yeah. For sure. Number one. But number two, if someone's blunt or very direct, you know, don't you agree to that? Like, even if you're a little bit more of a sensitive personality or whatever the case is, like you need to just learn how to take that yeah. if you're oh, going to yeah. be involved in this. Oh yeah. I mean like it's, you, you can't take it personally, but I also take it personally, <laughs> but at the same time, I'm like, well, that dude said that. Fuck him. Like I'm going to, I'm going to come back better. Like, yeah. I mean, that, you have to have that attitude of like, well, what he said was right. Take that in and, or what, you know, whoever said was right. Take it in get mad about it and then be like, all right, well, how do I fix that issue? Mm -hmm. But uh, the weird part about that is at the same time is you got to pick and choose who you're taking that criticism from and how you're taking it because there's plenty of people out there that'll give you shit criticism sure. that does not apply at all or is completely wrong. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, if, if, if somebody that you respect is telling you that, then be like, Oh, I got to do better. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and, and not only that, but there's you also might want to take extra consideration to the fact that there's a reason why they're going ahead and just being so upfront mm -hmm. and honest and blunt about it is because these animals, they don't have a lot of time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you're doing something wrong or whatever and something needs to be corrected, like you need to do it now. Yeah. Like now. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't, you're either, the, the you know, they're, they're either going to have even worse issues or possibly die. die. I mean, you need to correct yeah. what you're doing now. And yeah. that's the reason why it's not, it's not always a situation where you're trying to, you know, hurt anybody's feelings, but it's, it's there, there is a sense of urgency. Yeah. It's like, Hey, you might want to really consider this right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I actually, you know, I don't like to dole out criticism because I have not been in the game that long and I have only experience with red tails. Mm -hmm. So, and not very many. So like, if I'm going to give you advice, I'm going to preface it pretty hard to begin with. Sure. Be like, Hey man, like you can either listen to me or not. And if you don't, that's totally fine. But like, I I can see what's happening right now as somebody that's not invested in this bird, mm -hmm. and you might wanna you might wanna do this. Sure. And it's only happened a couple times, and I've just been like, hey, you might wanna rethink this part. Yeah, yeah. I mean, especially when it comes to unsolicited advice, you know, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, just be like, throw it out there. You can ignore it if you want. Yeah, you always gotta put a disclaimer behind it. Yeah, you know? yeah. There is proper etiquette in that regard for sure. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's very true. Like, and to see, to see falconers that I really respect being very patient with people that you're like, oh my gosh, like this can be bad. This could be bad. And they're like, Hey, you need to consider this. You need to think about this part. And then they can just like, kind of stop it there mm -hmm. and be like, I, I told them what they needed to hear and I'm going to move on. Sure. Like, and not be invested in being like, Hey, you're really messing up right now. Yeah, I mean, it all it all goes back to the whole thing of, I mean, it's a big reason why, you know, I've I kind of done what I can to kind of keep myself to myself and have, you know, very little, you know, expectations of, of other people. And, and it, it doesn't pay a lot of times to be overly invested in what a lot of other people do. So you mm -hmm. have no control over yeah. it in the end anyway. Yeah, you can't, yeah, you're not, you can't be the police. Sure. Yeah, and it's not your, it's not your role to be that, right. you know. Ideally, that person has a sponsor or other outside influence. If they're not doing their job, it's not on you. you know? Right. But yeah. anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, this this tequila, whatever you've got over here, man, <laughs> it is kicking in hard. Oh, this is this very tasty extra añejo. It's very good. <laughs> it's my jam. I, yeah. I mean, as you know, I'm normally a rum guy. Oh, and, well, you know, I, heard, I learned last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's this. No, to kill you is not normally a part of my uh, regimen, uh -huh. so to speak. But uh, but anyway, man, no, I appreciate you, you know, being able to, you know, be flexible enough to squeeze this in and stuff and, and get in a, a recording. You know, who knows when we're going to be in the same place at the same time again. Yeah. Know, and, but um, but yeah, I mean, we've already kind of talked about different things that I mean, I guess could be construed as advice or whatever. But I mean. Before I wrap up these episodes, I always try and get at least, you know, one other, you know, piece of advice or like, what, what's the most impactful thing so far that you think that you've learned in falconry that other people could benefit oh, from knowing? I mean, for me, it's just staying on it. Like there's plenty, like I second guess, why am I doing this? Like it's so difficult, or at least to me, it seems like it's, it's kind of overwhelmingly like you have this bird that's, you know regulated it, it's just crazy to even have it in your house kind of thing and like you know you're going out there hunting with this animal every time you go out it's potential death you know for this bird and um i every season i'm just like there i hit points every single time it's like man who 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 is this person that's doing this because it's not me but at the <laughs> same time just be like well shut up and just get out there just keep going just keep doing it. Like, you know, there's high highs and low lows in it for sure. And I'm, I'm dealing with it right now with a bird with a broken wing mm -hmm. and like, she's hopefully getting back up. Like everything's looking good right now, but you know, it's hard. It's and it's super discouraging. And you talk to anybody that's been doing it for a while and you know, be like, dude, it's going to happen. Birds are going to die. Birds are going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. Dogs are going to die. Dogs are going to get hurt. 
Like if you have the dedication, like if you have it as a passion, just keep doing it. Yeah. No. And, and that's, yeah. I mean, you've, <laughs> this, I think more than a lot of other things in life is, is an avenue that you can go down in which you are going to constantly be faced with challenges over and over oh, and yeah. over again. And, uh, challenges to, to the way you do things, your own ego, you know, challenges to being able to, to meet whatever standards that you have of yourself and what other people have of you that mm -hmm. are trying to teach you how to do it, so on and so forth. And, um, yeah, no, I mean, it's uh it's a never ending battle. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, if it was easy, would it be as fun? I don't know. You well, know, it's the reason why not everybody can do it. Too. Right. Right. Yeah. What do you, um, I mean, before we get off here, I mean, what do you, what do you think you want to do next? Oh, shoot. Well, so the idea was to let this bird go at the end of this year. Um, and she was a monster before she broke her wing. Like we were, we were on a, on a good roll. And, um, the idea was to release her at the end of this year. So now I'm not quite sure if that's going to happen or not. Um, the vet that I'm going to, who is amazing, um, t you know, was saying that after the rehab and stuff like that, she sh still should be pretty good to let go. Like you shouldn't have <clears throat> any trepidation about that. So, I mean, I think for me, I just want to get more training under my belt. Like I want to just to trap, you know, most likely another red tail, play with Kestrels too, maybe somewhere in between, um, just find things that work locally for me. I mean, I would love to see goshawks fly, but like in our area, they just don't do so well. Um, but I mean, talk about squirrel birds. Like I would love to see that. I would love to be able to get that going. Um, so, but that's like way in the future. Yeah. Red tail for me, like I have, I don't know if it's good or bad, but, um, I love them. Like I have, I have that, like, I don't, I don't know if I need anything else. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. I mean, if, if that's what you like and if that's what turns your crank, man, I mean, there's, <laughs> there's probably not a better bird. Yeah. I mean, you know? they're powerful. They're forgiving, which is probably the biggest thing that I need. <laughs> um, cause I make mistakes all the time. I'm still learning so much, um, you know, trying to take everything in, but like they're a very forgiving bird, but they'll just get right back up and keep going. Well, and not only that, but aside from gas money, they're also free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. I mean, you know, trapping red tails is kind of a part of meat and potatoes, the foundation of, of United States falconry. Yeah. And hell, you know, I mean, if, if, if that's the bird that's going to always turn your crank, there's, there, <laughs> there's, there's worse choices you can oh, have. Oh yeah. You know? And there's plenty, you know, obviously there's plenty of different opportunities out there with them. Like, they're everywhere. So they've seen everything. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you got colorations and everything else that are, you know, crazy to see, beautiful to see, things that you don't normally see. Mm -hmm. And um, their personality is just like, they work for what I'm doing. Sure. And of course, like, I mean, the female that I have right now, she's like, I mean, big old feet, smaller bird, smaller female. But she just hammers squirrels. She can handle them very well. And we have, like, where where I am, it's just all fox squirrels. These things are big and mean. And she just handles them. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, and that's, I mean, I would say we have almost equal, but maybe a slight edge as far as fox squirrels versus gray squirrels where I'm at, too. You know, I mean, if, if you've got one that can handle them and... um doesn't get bit so that they're discouraged from them mm -hmm. and that's that's awesome yeah she she i mean she's taking her fair share for yeah. sure and yeah. um you know um sometimes she'll let them go like as she's gotten older like that's why so this will be her and you know this hatch year she'll be five so it's kind of that time to if you're yep. gonna keep her keep her if you're gonna let her go let her go yeah and um so you know, that's kind of where we're at with it. And she's gotten, you know, it's, it's been interesting to watch a bird who was a made bird. She, she can handle her shit, go from like just taking everything to being selective and then playing with weight to be like, Hey, what, what does it mean? How are you approaching this? Because you're at this weight right now. 
versus if you're hungrier, not whatever, like whatever the slip does, you know, it, it's, it's really, I know that some people are like, well, just get a passage every year. Just let it go at the end of the year, get a passage. But it, for me learning, it's been really nice to see the progression of the bird because it's helped me progress too. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm, I kind of think that the guys like Fincher, you know, for example, have, have a really good system in place too, where they, they like to have an intermute bird <laughs> and a passage bird every year. Oh yeah. And so if one, you know, has an issue, then they have another Just one as, as backup. One. And then that inner, that, uh, that passage bird, if it's decent enough, they'll keep it, intermute it, and then just kind of mm-hmm. have, have a rotation going. Everybody is, figures out what's going to work best for them. Yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, it is what it is, man. I mean, you'll, you'll figure it out. And, um, you know, I mean, I, yeah, you're right. You're right though. You're right. Kind of on that cusp where it's really probably going to be most beneficial for you and the bird, both just go and make, make other red tail babies yeah, make later babies. on. And, yeah. <laughs> I want to take, I mean, cause she's a monster. So I want to take some of her offspring, hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I need to, you know, I want to, I want to learn more. I want to have more experiences. I, unfortunately, again, that just keep going. Like, I'm going to need a bad bird. I'm going to need a bad bird that like teaches me to be like, cut this sucker loose. We're done. Because I haven't cut a bird loose, like being like, you're not with the program. Let's go. Get out of here. It's, it's a hard lesson to learn. You know, I mean, sometimes it's, um, it's, it's much of a curse, if not more of a curse and a blessing having good first birds, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, um, when you start having e- birds that aren't as good and you have to deal with that and figure yeah. out that like, okay, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's the thing is she can make it look easy right now and mm-hmm. she has for a while. And like, so what is that teaching me? It's not teaching you anything. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So if, if your goal is to learn and grow, then you've pretty much already got your answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So but anyway, I think it's probably a good note to end on, man. I know awesome. this. I know this raffle and everything else and dinner. Oh, is I gotta be... win some shit. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love to say that I'm going to also. I haven't. My my raffle luck here over the last couple of years hasn't been that great. But anyway, I mean, thanks for squeezing this in with me, and and I hope it's been a fun hour for oh, you. Oh, thank you, know? you so much, and yeah. it was it was great to meet you too, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's awesome, and uh, yeah, we'll talk more later. Awesome.